Tegu knew that two friends in Tel Aviv, Israel would form a company in 92 and release a plugin in 94 that would live on until this day. And if you've heard the acoustic guitars on Fergie, Big Girls Don't Cry mixed by JJ Poog, the piano and timpani on Rehab by Amy Winehouse, or even as recently as the claps in the beat in Cardi B's Bodak Yellow mixed by Evan LaRay, you've heard the byproduct of the world's oldest limiter plugin, The Waves R1. That's right, this limiter has stood the test of time. Even myself, it's one of my go-tos for parallel compressing 808s and bass lines, but originally this was created as a means for mastering engineers to buy headroom and make tracks loud. And it really piques my curiosity because I want to see how well it competes against the Fab Filter Pro L2. Because I think we take many things for granted, especially access to incredible tools. You see, at the 1996 AES convention, Sweetwater published. The Waves L1 Ultra Maximizer is now available for Sonic Foundry's SoundForge on Windows 95 platforms. Many pro users say it's the best peak limiter in the world, list price $600. So $600 USD in 1996 for a floppy disk version of L1, adjusted for inflation in today's money is $1,116. Today, you can pick that plugin up for $49 on the Waze website or buy a handful of different limiters on the market for a fraction of the cost. So what I want to do is take a proper look at the L1 and give it a feature and technical comparison to the FabFilter Pro L2. Now, I know that might be oranges and apples as some of you say, but I just want to do this to look back and see how far things have really come. Then I have a spanking EDM tune here, which we're going to put head to head because in my head, whenever I think L1, L2, I think Darude Sandstorm and absolutely pumping and slapping EDM tunes. Let's see if it's cut out. Let's see if it's cut out for the competition of 2023. So I've got a little list here, comparison list. The L1 Ultra Maximizer has a look ahead limiter. You can change the input, threshold gain, output ceiling. You can change the release and you've got dither options. You can't change the attack time. There is true peak limiting, but keeping true to the 1994 version, it didn't have true peak limiting at the time. It can't oversample. There's not different limiting algorithms or mode. You've either got the auto release or manual release, and that's about where it starts and end. You can't side tr you can't side chain trigger it for stem mastering like you can on the Pro L2. Uh, you can't monitor the delta signal because in the Pro L2, what you can do is you can scooch over here, turn the headphones on, and listen to the different signal. And it doesn't have an adjustable look ahead like the Pro L2 does. And you've got no adjustments for stereo linking uh, between the left and right channel. So feature set, much less. However, how big of a deal is that in context of actually mastering something? So what we're going to do is I've got this EDM track here, Daniel Tonic, uh, On My Skin. It's a cool tune. And my aim here is to get it just as loud as possible with each one. See how loud they both get. See how punchy they are. And then compare the two. happy with that what I noticed was that I could get it louder with a much slower release but then it became really pudgy whereas if I like a negative 10 threat when the threshold was a negative 10 didn't matter what I did to the release it would start pumping or get a little bit pudgy like in pudgy is in terms of the transients weren't really clear you couldn't hear much distance between the snap of the kick and the body of the um, and the body of the music. So I dialed it back to negative eight threshold, given that this is at zero dB peak. That's quite a lot of game reduction going on and it's handling it pretty well. Take a listen. So I'm pretty happy with where that is. It's super loud. And now let's dial in the Pro L2. Oh, and also another note with the L1, as I brought the release faster. So what I did was I dialed the threshold back, but made the release faster. So it was a little bit more aggressive and 
it just did something to the snaps. I think it's a little bit of distortion it's introducing. Um, not a bad form of distortion, more like just a harmonic distortion, which is making those transients snap a little bit. Now let's go to the L2. the transparent mode because I'm going to use the features that are available for each one and the fact is I can use this attack module as a hard clipper for those initial transients to give me a bit more room to drive it. Now let's listen and A, B. So some things here, I've pulled the channel linking off the transients just so they're purely independently hard clipping those first 42 milliseconds over the threshold. And then you've got the release stage, which is very fast. Um, but I, I know I can push the L2 more. I could push the L2 to 10 and it'd be fine. But I still want to keep it relatively same loudness when I'm A, Bing. Um, and let's let's actually have a let, let me actually match the loudness. Actually, that's a good point. I should match the loudness before we compare these. They're the same loudness, both 6.1 short term. So let's A B them. The L1 is the top, the L2 is the bottom. Let's put these bad boys next to one another. 1994 versus 2020, whenever the L2 was released. 2018. It's been out for a while, but let's say 2023, hey? Do you know what I really like about the L1. There are qualities I like about both. The L2, much more snappy, much more like the, the tack of each kick. That t -t 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 is very clear, well-defined, good depth there. But the L1 is more warmer and more pudgier. Now, warm is a bad adjective to use here. Basically, what it's not doing is fucking up the subs. So it's actually, the L1's doing a really good job at keeping those subs intact nicely. And I think that is to do with, because it's got a set look ahead, I don't actually know what the look ahead is on the L1, but let's try and use the look ahead here just to give us a little bit more of a, an edge on the L2 and see if we can get a bit of that low end back in. <laughs> You know, I also think it's the mode. I'm going to go to punchy mode and let's take a listen to that now. You know what? I actually, for this instance, I reckon the L1 is winning. As much as I'm trying to, I know this is stupid amounts of limiting going on for both of them, but the L1 just works for dance music really well. It always has, actually. That was um, when I started, like, mastering, when was it, like, 12 years ago, using L2. Um, that was, like, my favorite to use on EDM tracks because it did do that to the low end. It kept it pumping. It kept it thick and subby, whereas the Pro L2 sort of loses that a bit. I think I might bring the L1 back into my, my workflow a little bit more for these dance tracks. Take a listen to this. The 
mid-range on the L2, the Pro L2, sorry, is a bit more neutral and there it scoops a little bit on the L1 because you are like relative, there's more subs, so there's less mid-range. It does feel like the mid-range gets scooped a bit. This is a more present and upfront sort of feel. So what can we take from that? Oh, we can take that this is a, this is a really old limiter and I would never discount it. I just wouldn't say it's, it's, it's something you shouldn't think about using. Now, technically I'm not using this in mastering. I'm using more so the Ozone Maximizer. Sometimes the Pro L2, this has been many, the, actually the, the Waves L2 has been very long since I've actually used it, but there's a reason why it stood the test of time because it sounds good. Um, and I just thought it'd be fun just to go down memory lane and bring it into a session and compare it to an, a, a more modern limiter for you guys. Hope you enjoyed this. And if you did, make sure to subscribe, all right? Until next time, take care.